Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining our debate, The Government Hacks Back, Chaos or Security. And let me first say that this uh, is a debating format, so it's a bit different from a panel discussion, and that's intentional because we'd like to involve all of you in a debate. We'd like you to actually also actively debate after the first half um, of this session. And so in the first half, we'll have our four excellent speakers here on the panel in two different teams debating with each other before we'll open up <laughs> the audience and uh, you can join whichever team you like or open a new team <laughs> just by yourself. Um, more on that later. Um, the topic we'll discuss today is government hackbacks and implications for security. And um, the core question of the workshop is, should law enforcement agencies have the authority to hack back computer systems that pose a severe threat to individual and public safety, no matter where these systems are located, in order to protect the citizens and others' security? As you can imagine, this is a, a contested issue and it's currently being discussed in many countries um, and some countries have already adopted uh, clauses like active defense or others in their cybersecurity strategies. So this is a topic that will be debated um, even more in the future. And uh, we will also discuss what exactly hackback means later um, in the session. Uh, our speakers will also um, talk about this a little more. So um, such scenarios, uh, as I said, are already being thought about or even implemented. And these steps have also been met with um, resistance or fierce debate from many different actors in society, industry, um, and users. So uh, we'll debate um, all these different issues here. Um, the motion we'll discuss in this Oxford-style debate will be, this house believes that governments should have authority under certain circumstances to hack back devices which serve as attack tools. And they can do so in order to neutralize the threat posed to systems within their jurisdiction. These, uh, this motion will be debated by two teams of speakers. Um, the team on my left, Sven Herpik and Tatjana Tropina. And <laughs> the team on my right, Leandro Utsiferi and Martin van Horenbeck. Let me briefly in introduce them. Sven Herpik to my left, is the project leader for international cybersecurity policy at the think tank Stiftung Neue Verantwortung, which is a nonprofit think tank based in Berlin, in Germany. And before um, this role, Sven has worked in various government departments on cybersecurity issues. Tatjana Tropina is a lawyer um, and an expert on cybercrime and cyber law in general. She's a senior researcher at Max Planck. In Max Planck Institute for Foreign and International Criminal Law in Freiburg in Germany. On my right, we have Leandro Uciferi, and he's a lawyer and researcher with a focus on human rights, privacy, and freedom of expression at this Association for Civil Rights, ADC, um, which is an independent nonprofit NGO based in Argentina. And then on the very right, we have Martin van Horenbeck, um, he's Director of Security Engineering at Fastly, that is a content delivery network that speeds up web properties around the world, and he's also a board member and former chairman of the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams First, um, that is an association of certs and or C-certs. So now a brief word on the agenda. I will pose two rounds of questions to our debaters, and each of them will have three to four minutes to answer this question. After these two rounds, um, speakers will have around 10 minutes to respond to each other. And then after this first half, we will open up the debate and you will be able to pose first questions to the speakers here that they have to answer. And then um, for, the, for the last 20 minutes of this debate, you will become debaters yourself, yourselves and make interventions of um, around two minutes uh, limit, time limit <laughs> yourselves. That's it from me. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this debate. My name is Isabel Skierka, by the way, and I work for Digital Society Institute in Berlin. Um, forgot to introduce myself, sorry. And so we'll start off uh, with the first question to Sven. Sven, 
Will an expanded practice of gov government hackbacks result in more or less collective security? Thank you, Isabel. Uh, good afternoon from my side as well. Um, I think in order to make to answer that question and also to make in general informed decisions about policies, um, we first have to look at what hackbacks actually mean. That's the biggest struggle that many actors face that are currently debating uh, hackback is what is what is actually supposed to be a hackback. So I'm doing a bit of the academic role here and saying, okay, let's talk about the definition first, the most exciting topic always. Um, but I would like to just give you a quick run through of what different stakeholders and governments have subsumed under hackback. Um, and based on that, I think we can discuss it more clearly. Um, and when I say discussed under hackback, I mean in the civilian domain only first. Um, and to give you also some kind of my idea what I t uh, think about that, I categorize them in three categories from uh, not too problematic to awful. Okay, so uh, category one, not too problematic. So there's a prevention mechanism such as firewalls, antivirus, cyber hygiene, in, uh, passive intelligence gathering, um, exchanging of indicators of compromise, all these things are considered from some governments as the first level of hackbacks. Then the assistance of national internet service providers to deflect, reroute, or block attacks such as den distributed denial of service attacks and or in connection with sinkholing. Together with that, nationally or internationally coordinated botnet takedowns by law enforcement agencies and ISPs such as happened, for example, in the Avalanche case. And then lastly in that category, setting up traps such as honeypots or inserting beacons into documents that send the location when they are stolen. So when they're leaving your company network or government network, um, they're triggered, they send the IP location of where they are now back to the original creator. So that's the category that I would describe as category one, not too problematic. The second category, which I would like to call as quote unquote gray, gray area, is um, assistance of national internet service providers in conducting a walled garden approach. Walled garden approach is basically ISPs um, identify certain bots in their systems, computers of private citizens, for example, and what they do is they don't allow them to go on the internet again. They will just show them a web page that says, your computer is infected, you can download something here to um, clean your computer, and after you clean your computer, we can let you back to the internet. Second part in that category is passive reconnaissance and foreign networks to improve the attribution. So if you want to do a hackback, first you have to do well, attribution of what you want to hackback if you want to do it correctly. Um, so passive reconnaissance of mainly intelligence agencies. And the third part of that category is inserting beacons into documents which basically create malware that once these documents are stolen from you and the documents are opened, the trigger, it for example deletes the device um, um, where it was copied to. That's what I call the gray area category. And the third category, which is like highly problematic, not feasible, and um, maybe even uh, you won't consider it awful, uh, consists of four parts. Penetration of foreign systems to conduct reconnaissance, penetration of foreign systems to delete stolen content, or steal it back, quote unquote, um, quote of the German government. Penetration of foreign systems to shut down these systems or disrupt them temporarily. And lastly, penetration of foreign systems to quote unquote destroy them or to disrupt them more permanently. To answer your question, Isabel, I think there's no catch all approach, there's no catch all answer, but definitely I would say that those that I subsumed just under category one about not too problematic hackback measures, they are not, not so bad, they're okay. Uh, category two, I have, I have my problems with that, but I think some of them are debatable. And if you take them into consideration, you can actually improve national security without necessarily decreasing collective security simultaneously. Okay, thank you. Now I give the floor to Martin. Thank you very much, Isabel, and thank you for having me here. So I, I very much like the set of definitions that was just brought up because it ties into the fact that the motion didn't really have a definition of what the hackback is, but it does have a definition of why it is being done. And I'll start from there because when I look at collective security, I look at it as a technical community member. As in when we use the internet today, how can some of these activities lead to destabilization or other issues that are, are of concern to us? And I would argue that the first problem with hackbacks is that you actually don't really know who you are hacking. You may be hacking an IP address, but you don't necessarily know if that machine is running some type of critical service, 
you don't really know what country that machine is based in. It may be that it's actually connecting to the internet via a VPN, and you're actually attacking a VPN endpoint that's located in a different country. And you also don't really necessarily know who the user of that machine is. You may get that information through other means, but in some cases, such as what is running on the machine, you can't really determine that until you've actually compromised the machine. And this is where it becomes a little bit difficult, because when you compromise a machine, and this is admittedly the third category of types of attacks that was just mentioned, when you compromise a machine, you are changing the execution flow that was intended of the person who actually installed, configured, and operates the machine. And this is of concern because even when you think of a very, very stable exploit, that exploit is still going to have a limited case of, uh, or limited set of scenarios where it fails and where it's actually going to destabilize the machine that the code is running on or the user is using. And if that machine is supporting some level of critical infrastructure or is uh, supporting a hospital, then you may actually end up causing harm to life. And this is concerning because does this mean that we are motivating attackers to compromise systems that are that sensitive to then use them in their criminal acts? So that's destabilizing in itself if we go and target those machines. The second problem with hacking back is that someone is going to have to do the hacking, and that may be law enforcement. Now the problem is that in some cases law enforcement is also a point of contact for security incidents. Um, that typically is only the case when the country doesn't have a good computer emergency response team or no good CSERT community that can work on incidents, but those cases today definitely exist. And it means that as, for instance, a software vendor, you would be less likely to provide information on compromised machines or machines involved in an incident to that particular organization. Because let's say that in a particular uh, country, the law enforcement authority or the authority that is authorized to do these hackbacks is responsible for reaching out to individuals when they've had a, an incident, uh, most likely criminal, potentially not. If that organization receives data on vulnerable systems in a country, then the software vendor, in a way, has provided a tool to that agency to compromise those machines. So that's a really concerning idea and, and something that can really make it difficult to respond to incidents with some of these countries. Next, they also do have the, uh, Hacking Back does have the potential of destabilizing the way that states work with each other on the internet. And I'll use a very silly example, but uh, there are certain software applications that are only used in particular countries or by particular language groups. Word processors have actually been a great example for this. There's a, a word presser, a processor called Ichitaro, which is very popular in Japan, another word called Hangul, which is almost uniquely used in Korea. Let's say that a law enforcement agency wants to compromise a system and they identify that this word processor is the way to do it. And they invest in developing an exploit or attack code <coughs> to take over that word process processor. And that exploit code leaks. Does this mean that one state ended up attacking another state or is this still a simple law enforcement operation? That's just one example of how actually investing in exploits and investing in offensive code to, to do some of these hackbacks can really have destabilizing consequences. Another one that we've seen quite recently uh, was actually fairly um, common in a sense that it, um, it involved code that was used by um, intelligence agencies and that then leaked and was used to attack others. So I'll leave it with that, but in, from that perspective, I, I have trouble endorsing hacking back as something that can increase collective security. Thanks a lot, Martin. Tatiana, from the other team, please, now. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I have to admit that I do have a problem with the question itself. When we are talking about collective security, there are so many definitions of cybersecurity, so I'm a bit lost in the notion of collective. So, and, and I believe that the answer would be different. Are we talking about security on the international level, meaning how states working with each other? Or are we talking about security on the national level? And I believe that if we are talking about crime investigation, crime prevention, cr disruption, mitigation of threats, if we are talking about civil and <coughs> military defense on the, on the national level, well, we can all disagree here that they, um, uh, or that hugbacks are helpful, but look at the cybersecurity strategies. Many countries openly declare that they are going to use offensive capabilities as integral part of their 
collective or national cybersecurity strategies. And it means that there is an opinion that they are helpful, that not only defense will help, but also offensive capabilities. So my answer here would be that it will depend on which domain you are looking at. If we are looking at law enforcement, they will probably do it with many safeguards and, and it's easy to regulate. And I agree here with Sven that some of the very obvious hardbacks which are regulated, which are done for good, are very helpful. If we are talking about military or intelligence, well, apparently on the national level they do consider them helpful. And um, if we are talking intelligence services, I believe that hardbacks might be helpful for cyber intelligence and for gathering information for providing policy makers with informed decision. So I believe that there is no obvious you know, black or white here. It is gray. But I tend to say that on the national level, they are helpful. On the international level, how they might influence states working together, well, no, they're not helpful. They will probably uh, result in less collective security on the international level. But then the question is, what is collective security on the international level? Uh, in the age when GGE couldn't agree even even kind of on the soft law on the responsible state behavior. Are we really in a position to say that in the nearest future, hardbacks will be prohibited? To me, it's like believing that espionage can be prohibited or we can implement safeguards. So let's get real here. Are, are they helpful or not? They are being implemented and apparently on the national level, they are considered to be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Tatiana. And Leandro, please. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. Um, okay, so I, I will start uh, complimenting my colleague Martin here. Um, of course, I, I believe that hacking by governments weakens collective cybersecurity, and I agree also with Tatiana that there are a lot of definitions on what cybersecurity actually is, and states does not seem to um, agree on a common understanding on, on that same topic. Um, but I do believe that, of course, coming from civil society, cybersecurity is the people's security, the, the people who uses the technology. So um, I do think that when the governments hack, um, hack even uh, proactively or hack back after um, something occurred to them, as they would argue, um, I think people's trust um, is undermined. So that in itself, uh, I say it weakens collective cybersecurity at the international level. Um, and also, it's kind of tricky when talking about boundaries online. Uh, it's not the, uh, I mean, we have discussed about jurisdiction on the internet for how long now? Um, it's kind of difficult to, to give borders uh, to how we use the technology um, on a day-by-day -day basis. And that translates as well to this, uh, to this debate, I think. Um, I also wanted to raise the, the point that by nature hacking is an activity that interferes with a broad range of human rights. Uh, we're not just discussing privacy and various freedoms such as expression, opinion, thought, peaceful assembly and association, but also we need to take into account due process and property as well. Uh, as Martin mentioned, uh, when uh, a government hacks, uh, they are actively engaging with our property, people's property, uh, and we need to take that into consideration as well. Um, I agree that ex exploits and malware can act unpredictably, so the, r the range in which operations can go wrong when the government hacks is, of course, um, more dangerous as a sort of collateral damage that may occur uh, when, when there are operations. Other problems that arise in terms of uh, giving capabilities of hacking or faculties uh, in, in legal frameworks to government hacking is that there's a huge black market on vulnerabilities and it appears that it's not going to, to, to stop, it's not going to, to slow down, um, it's only getting bigger and bigger. So there are researchers that are, that are paid more by companies to resell exploits than by software or by cybersecurity companies to actually fix the vulnerabilities per se. So it's also one thing that we need to take into consideration is that there's this sort of race to um, hoard vulnerabilities and use zero-day exploits or use specific malware that usually the people who develop it 
does not have the um, uh, a tight control on how those uh, kind of softwares are going to be used. So it can it can be a government, but it can also be a distributor that uh, as hacking team as NSO group uh, distribute the software to a bunch of countries who have uh, no respect to human rights, to say the least. Um, so this takes us to another point related to cybersecurity as well, is that as zero days, as malware, as exploits become cheaper and cheaper, then there's no reason to use other investigative tools or use other means to uh, find uh, the guilty, uh, the, 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 the guilty people uh, that committed a crime, uh, or that is uh, the 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 person responsible, say, for um, a murder or a, a petty crime or something that the government is, is investigating. So this is also that we need to take into consideration, and I think we're going to, to debate a bit more in the next question, so I, I don't want to jump ahead. Um, also, the last two points that I wanted to, to raise is that security is not equal for everyone. Um, people that have lower resources, that have lower incomes, or that doesn't have specific access to specific technologies or specific consumer products or even to specific knowledge is not as secure as people that has that specific knowledge. Um, someone who has an iPhone today is probably more secure than someone who has a not updated Android from five years ago or two years ago. And we need to take that into consideration as well. Um, and the last point that I wanted to raise is that there seems to be kind of a double standard in terms of the criminalization of um, information security researchers and how the government is advocating for m the need of more capabilities to do hacking. So there seems to be this um, unbalanced situation when, when um, independent researchers or cybersecurity firms, apparently they are uh, criminalizing their activities by finding the vulnerabilities and fixing them and the government trying to make use of those vulnerabilities for their own uh, gains. Thanks so much for the first round of responses. I think what we can um, just quickly uh, recap is that, of course, we um, need to define what collective security means. Uh, we have the technical dimension of IT security. We have a human security dimension involved here, individual user security. We have the national security level and we have international cooperation and how that is um, influenced here. Um, your side uh, pointed that out and you also pointed out that um, hacking back is no catch-all phrase. We have to look at the different uh, levels of hacking back that can occur, um, of which some are less and some are much more problematic. And so, um, uh, whereas many of them still fall into the legal gray area. And then um, on, so, so we need safeguards um, depending on uh, which institution will, um, will conduct them. And uh, for sure, as you said, if intelligence agencies or the military conduct them without many safeguards, this will only lead to international instability. Um, and from this side, we heard a lot of uh, good argument about, arguments about how um, uncontrolled, but even um, hackbacks with uh, safeguards can lead to a uh, destabilization of the internet of technical systems um, as such because it's a very complex system uh, we're talking about here. Um, we have a conflict of responsibilities as well when it comes to vulnerability disclosure, for example, as you pointed out, Martin. And um, there's a great potential that um, hacking back can destabilize relations between states. Um, also, um, there's a danger that this will fuel the vulnerability marker, market and um, we really haven't even touched uh, on an international level the question of um, jurisdiction and borders and how states would actually um, react to such hackbacks or um, even have any possibility to interpret them when um, their server is hacked um, and they cannot really um, attribute it. So the second question I would like to pose to you now in the same order is should governments refrain from expanding hackback authorizations and adopt alternative measures? And if so, which ones? Sven. Thank you, Isabel. So my job would now be to say no. Uh, but I mean, 
we all heard our positions, and I think uh, you see that we all agree on a certain bottom line, which is de definitely that hacking back uh, the category three, I described it. Uh, no one here on the panel actually likes that. So I actually, <laughs> uh, sorry for that. So I actually want to, uh, to pursue what Tatjana just said, which is like, quote unquote, let's be real. So let's be real. Um, why did I bring up this stuff with the definitions? Not because I think it's so much fun, but because I feel like in the discussion we have, at least in Germany, we, um, as civil society advocating against hackbacks, losing the discussion right now and losing a lot of ground because everything is assumed under hackbacks. And because of that, I mean, who's against, who can be against cyber hygiene? Who can be against firewalls? No one can be against firewalls. So by putting that into the hackback discussion makes it very difficult. So if we want to become real, I think our first point should be we have to come up with a definition. We have to promote a certain a joint definition of what hackbacks are and what they are not. And second of all, we have to prepare for the worst. So if the governments are pursuing that, even if we now say, no, we don't want them to expand on it and please do other things, they might still do that. We have to prepare for that. So we have to come up with safeguards. We have to come up with a legal framework, a legal minimum standards for government hacking and for a vulnerability management process, which can look like or might look a bit different than uh, what the US just published with their vulnerability equities process. So no, I don't think they should be expanded. And in some cases, I actually be believe they should be even decreased. If we look at Germany, for example, all the category one and half of the category two stuff that I just mentioned to you is already allowed there by law. And now it's the talk is just about the last four or five steps towards it. So um, I leave it at that, I think. Good. Um, yeah, Martin. Thank you. So I think we need to take a little step back to think about why we're hacking back. And there's a couple of reasons why we may do that. The first one is deterrence. That typically doesn't work. And I think the best evidence for that is that even, for instance, today, states that have the best offensive capability are still being attacked. The second reason why we might want to do it is to recover data that was stolen or to stop the data from being spread. I think in those cases, we're usually too late. The moment the data flows through, it's out there and it may have already been redistributed. And the third one is to stop the attack. And I feel that taking offensive action by hacking back is actually the wrong way to stop an attack because we have good ways. We have a global community of incident response teams. We have response procedures. We do have ways to stop attacks, but we need to invest in those ways and we need to build up that capability. I think using that money that would typically go to hack back offensive operations, if we put that to work to make software more secure, and actually work on building that global community of incident responders will actually end up in a much more secure place than when, than when we build these tools that may in the long run just destabilize things overall. Thank you. Thanks. Tatiana. Um, I know that as this team, I have to answer this question that they shouldn't <laughs> refrain, but you know, I have to say it again, let's be real. I'm very sorry that, you know, I'm sorry for this analogy, that when we discovered nuclear power, the first thing we did was nuclear bomb and not, you know, nuclear power station, which supply us with energy. And this comes back to uh, the point about investing this money rather to security systems and education and, 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 and source collaboration. The problem is that realistically, uh, when governments have this power or intelligence agencies or military in their toolbox, the answer is that once you get hugged back from another state, what are you going to do alternatively? Say, ay, 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 you're such a bad state? No, you want to have the same tool in your toolbox. You want to hug back. It's the same with espionage. It's the same with many other issues. And so I believe that in a way the horse is already out of the barn. And what we can do realistically, because we cannot stop the governments to, uh, to do this. And realistically again look at some of the cybersecurity strategies i'm sorry I, I will make i will i will make some examples look at the uk they declare openly that cybersecurity and cyber defense heavily defense uh, depends on offensive capabilities and they will do everything to develop them look at finnish cybersecurity strategy the cyber offensive capability is very much embedded into cyber defense concept and you will see it in at least, I don't know, three dozen of countries across the world. And you know what? This is much better than developing on, on the, uh, them on the sly. It is much better if the government says openly, yes, I'm going to do this. And here the question comes, 
how we can provide safeguards and checks and balances. And I believe that in this regard, law enforcement are much easier to regulate in terms of human rights and safeguards because they are visible, because law enforcement are the subject of criminal procedural law. So for many things, they have to get court authorization. So in a way, law enforcement are probably the, the, the most visible and easiest target to implement safeguards for any responsible government. As to military, I have to say here honestly, in this age of, of development of offensive and defensive capabilities simultaneously, when you, when from the military point of view, you think about your adversary having this capability, I don't know what can actually stop you from using it if you have it too. But I believe that here we come again to the process of responsible state behavior. I think that in this sense in general, we have to abandon this concept of soft power, soft law, norm making, confidence building measures. Apparently it's, it's, it's fulfilling its functions, but not enough. Maybe we do have to come to the idea that governments have to develop a hard law solution maybe a convention, maybe something else, but agree at least on the basic principles. And this would be the only way to implement safeguard for military hugs and, and for civil defense hugs. I, I'm, I'm just realistic here. I don't like this situation any bit, but unfortunately that's what I see. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so, okay, so for the sake of the, of the debate, of <laughs> course I'm going to argue that there should be a presumptive prohibition on government hacking. Um, I'm not saying that it should, it should not occur at any circumstances, but it should be the, presum the presumption should be that the government cannot uh, incur in government hacking. Um, and just to expand on, on that, I'd say that hacking can provide access to private information that may be far beyond the reach of a judicial or official investigation. Um, and another challenge that, that we have is, so how can we limit uh, court orders or, or warrants to say, okay, when, when you're using a malware, you don't know what you're gonna find. Um, malwares can act unpredictably. And if you access a computer, it's not going to be all tied up in silos. It's not like, okay, I have the photos of the terrorists that uh, bombed uh, the London too. Um, so I have his bank account, I have everything. I have his life on their computer or the, their cell phone. So. Um, it's also a question on how can we um, address uh, due process concerns and due process uh, guarantees um, when the government has these uh, capabilities. Um, the other thing that I wanted to raise is that I don't think that it's so easy to put safeguards on law enforcement. Um, it may be in Europe, it may be in the US as they have um, arguably stronger uh, institutions than in um, other regions of the world, but in the case of Latin America, I think it's already tricky to talk about like traditional safeguards and traditional investigations not even involving cybercrime. Um, and that is without taking into account that law enforcement agencies, officers, and um, if even government officials, other government officials from ministries, uh, they more often than not lack basic knowledge on human rights and civil liberties, which is also concerning when dealing with these um, pervasive um, techniques. Um, talking about the problem of attribution, again, just detailing two other concerns is that it's very difficult, as, as Martin said, it's very difficult to um, understand what would be the proportionate approach to respond. And that is also what can lead to misunderstandings between states and even between uh, different actors that are non-state um, actors. Um, and again, the collateral damage that may occur afterwards. Um, uh, I, I don't think I have the solution, of course. If not, I, I would not be here. Um, but I think we need to take an approach on understanding what are the limitations on each uh, specific context, on, on each country. Um, as Ben said, I, I don't think we have a catch-all uh, approach to this. And I, I think we need to take a nuanced approach in terms of what we understand, uh, how are we going to, to um, frame government hacking uh, in legislation. Um, I do like the approach that some NGOs 
um, uh, dead in terms of categorizing on what's the focus of the operations that the government wants to, uh, to implement, to say uh, they're trying to control a message or control the message that is being sent, they're trying to cause damage or they're trying to, to do surveillance and intelligence gathering. So then if we have that categorization, we can talk about specific provisions uh, concerning those specific techniques and activities that the government may use. Uh, but if not, we can't have um, a catch-all um, uh, solution. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, we've heard a lot more interesting points and I'd like to just um, take off here to you know, let you debate any open questions amongst you quickly. Um, I think one, one issue that we've heard here is that, uh, you know, let's be real, let's be realistic about this and this is something we can't prevent anymore. Governments are already, um, you know, writing certain clauses into their uh, cybersecurity strategies which might be even better because they declare it openly at least. So um, we need to take the next step and develop um, minimum standards um, and uh, also think about vulnerability disclosure um, and handling processes. So um, what, would you, what would your side say to that? I mean, you just uh, started answering this, but would you say that, um, you know, you, you also believe that realistically uh, we have to come to terms with this reality and, um, and then like ha what would, uh, for example, um, so first of all, that's a question, do you, do you think that or would you argue no, that's not the case? Um, and then what would, uh, you know, bodies like CERTs do about this? Sure, I think the first thing to, to come to terms with is that reality is something we can change. In fact, we change reality every day. And one of the ways by doing it is by pointing out when specific actions that are taken actually have the potential to be destructive. Um, I heard earlier the comparison with police activity. And one thing that for me stands out a little bit is that a lot of police activity can be surreptitious, as in they can do investigations uh, that the, the, the person in question doesn't know about. But in general, with police, you know at least what their intent is. And in this case, let's say that the police hacks a particular machine. First of all, it's never going to be clear that it's actually the police. It's not like the police shows up with uh, their car and you know that the police is on your system. The second thing is that the way that most espionage malware is written, which would be the most likely to be used in these types of investigations, it's actually written to be very, um, very um, useful in multiple scenarios, as in it doesn't just restrict you to getting a particular file from a system. It's almost always developed in a way that gives significant amounts of ownership to the investigator to get access. So if someone finds that on their system, they don't have a way of knowing that it's in fact a police service, or is it a foreign state, or is it a competitor? And I think those things should make us think about whether or not this is the right way to go, because we don't actually have that same ability to say, okay, this was a police investigation. Um, in fact, we don't really know what is happening on the system. So I think reality is something we can change and we need to be aware of these challenges and then actually think if whether it makes sense. And I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that there's probably a limited number of cases where some type of activity is potentially ac acceptable, but I think we haven't really gotten to the point yet where that's a common activity and I'm afraid that with the discussion now, it seems like we're going in that direction and that's something that I think is worth changing. Yeah, just to add on, on Martin's point, um, is that perhaps if we're put uh, between the sword and the wall, um, having to choose between pervasive massive surveillance and then targeted government hacking, then I would believe that in certain cases, government hacking would cause uh, the least damage. Um, so those are the challenges that we're facing. Even from civil society, when you have to argue um, the human rights perspective, um, it's also tough to consider how the government would actually use specific techniques, as Martin said, that they can't even control. Um, so those are the things that I, that I want to raise. Mm. You want to reply? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would like to reply first about law enforcement because I think that there is a bit of misunderstanding here about police arriving in the cars and so on. Police normally under the criminal law of any country has to 
um, measures, uh, two, set, two sets of measures. One of, them, one of the set of measures are the so-called open measures, like search. You have to arrive in the police car, you have to have a search warrant and so on. The other set of measures is a clandestine measure. So you intercept communication or you go to someone's house with a warrant, but you know, without letting them know, you install surveillance devices and so on. So this is already normal for the, for the police, it's practice. Secondly, not talking about hug bags, but infecting computers with malware. I'm not talking about the new provision in German law, which was adopted in June this year, because I'm not sure I, I, I'm in capacity to really assess it yet. But such provisions exist, for example, in France or in Spain, and yes, police has to get warned for this, and the safeguards are much higher, for example, than for a normal interception. Because comparing to normal interception, you have to um, get approval from a higher type of prosecutor, higher rank of prosecutor, a prosecution office. You have to present uh, more evidence. So it's, 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 it's tighter safeguards. So you cannot do this for any crime. So safeguards do not mean that we restricted, you know, here and there. Uh, we restricted for very particular set of crimes, we restricted with a higher prosecutor, office rank and, you know, come into the court, uh, maybe a commission of three judges considering this warrant and so on and so forth. There are many, um, many ways to ensure that this is the police and, and, and limit this police power. Um, so that's, that was my inter intervention concerning to the police. About changing the, the situation, it makes me very sad as well that the situation is like this. And I'm sorry for coming to this type of argument, but when I hear that we cannot um, even put safeguards on law enforcement, <coughs> in some countries. When I hear the next argument that we are able to change the situation with hug bags, it makes me sad. Because if we cannot do something very obvious, if we cannot make law enforcement to implement safeguards on simple measures such as interception and access to data, how are we going to prohibit hug bags or change the, the situation uh, which is much more in the gray area, much dangerous in scale and so on. I, I just, I, I see, you know, contradiction here. Yeah, Martin, about your, about your point, I mean, I also want to change reality. And I mean, I'm not being, I'm not being defeatist here. I'm not being saying, damn, it's going to happen anyway, so whatever. The point is, and that's most probably my German self speaking, it doesn't hurt to be prepared. So in case it hits us, we have something, right? Um, and, and maybe just one small one minute advertisement block, uh, if you allow Isabel. Uh, <laughs> We have, we have an expert working group with 40 experts from um, the US and the EU working on that issue, so on government safeguards, vulnerability management, come up with standards, and they come not only from all the sectors except government, but we have uh, everything from former NSA to German uh, cyber activists there, which made the first meeting very interesting, um, but it also resulted in, well, we need groups that are advocating completely against it, and we need people who put work in and prepare safeguards for if something goes wrong. I think that's a two-pronged approach that, that can't hurt. Mm -hmm. And then um, I want to extend a bit on, on the comment, Tatiana, that you just made. Um, I also believe that um, if, you, if you believe that in some countries, of course, it's difficult to put safeguards there, then it's also most probably very difficult there to be against hackbacks in general, right? But maybe also to give you a very short example of how restrictive safeguards can be, um, from the German example is we have like 2009, we had that uh, legal battle, and we had this uh, German Trojan horse, the Bundestrojaner, which is called. And um, after the Supreme Court rev uh, revised it, um, the guidelines were so restrictive that it was a malware that could only be used on Windows computers only to record Skype. It was basically not yeah. capable of doing anything else, so that's why it wasn't used anymore, which I think is a nice safeguard. Uh, so technically, you can make it very safe, safe from using. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Thanks. So now I'd like to open up the debate already because I saw some hands uh, going up. Um, yeah, I'm taking notes. Uh, first was um, Till, and actually I decided you can also make really short interventions or post questions right now. So let's keep it like that, and then um, we'll uh, we'll see. Uh, first, you will respond, and when time progresses, maybe I'll uh, shuffle the questions. 
Thank you, Isabel. Uh, my name is uh, Aut Pals, organizer of the Dutch Youth IGF. And I was wondering, because what this panel assumes is that we um, speak openly about state, state hacking, but if I were a state, I wouldn't tell the other states that I were hacking. <laughs> so what, uh, what would we do then? How would we react? Um, yeah, actually, look, there, is, uh, there, are, there are two dimensions of this. There is a concept of hacking, right? And the actual act of hacking. And so if I state that I'm going to hack in my security strategy, I can say it openly. But when I actually hack, they don't have to know who I hack, when, and so on. But I, I also believe that, you know, I, I'm a strong believer that when it goes openly, at least you know what to expect. At least, at least you know that state A, B, and C has debate or is developing the offensive capability and you know what to wait for in, uh, from the state. It's much better than, as you say, like, you know, we don't know what they're doing and, yeah, we can't talk openly. Sometimes I think we can. The debate in Germany about defensive and offensive capabilities, I think it's quite open and big and involves also civil society, academia, and so on. Of course, the default should be transparency, yeah. always. Um, and it's something that seems obvious, but it's not usually the case uh, in most countries. Uh, when you're debating for safeguards, you're debating in Congress, or you're supposed to debate in Congress, uh, because you're passing them by law. Because if not, if, if not it's only the will of the executive, uh, which is even worse. So I think, um, what can the, the general public do? Uh, advocate for more transparency on how the state works. And if you're going to advocate, uh, go, to, go to Congress um, and try to engage in those processes. Yeah, I think, well, uh, just using the multi-stakeholder approach like we have at the IGF, um, having different point of views, of course, is going to be even more relevant when talking about how the government is going to interfere with our, with our lives. Uh, so I guess that, that would be uh, the key starting point on, on this debate at the national levels. Yeah. Yeah, when it comes down to um, transparency about things that are already being conducted, not discussed, but already being conducted, then it comes back to um, not only transparency, but also um, oversight, for example, parliamentary oversight, and that's also another safeguard. Okay. Um, you were next, and please, yeah, please, uh, others, keep your hands up so I can actually note them down while Michael poses his <laughs> question. <laughs> okay, thanks. <coughs> okay, thank you. My name is Michael Rodert, coming from Germany, um, ECHO Association of the Internet Industry. Um, I'm missing arguments from both sides. Um, that is, the fact that some of the hackbacks only work due to the fact of poor programming of operating systems or <laughs> network layers, <laughs> firstly. Secondly, others are supported by, work only if supported by the um, operating system manufacturer. And I now have the question, we have the digitization in, um, in front of us coming and uh, more and more insurance companies are coming up and saying, well, we give you insurance against um, uh, malware, against all these thi things. Now, exploits are not uh, stopped because of hackbacks, and the insurance has to pay or not to pay. But um, mainly the operating Good system point. manufacturer argument. I, I, I would like to hear something uh, about this from you. Thank you. Get it on. <laughs> Thank you, that's a really interesting question. I think one of the things it actually points out is that we have a real inconsistency here in how we are dealing with this digital society. On the one hand, we're investing all of this effort, all of this time to make the products more secure, to incentivize people to actually fix all <coughs> of the issues that at the same time exactly those are the ones that we want to go and use to gain access to systems. And that to me is a, is a real contradiction and a challenge when you think of how we invest in, in uh, that we actually build this out. 
Now, regarding to software liability, I think that's a very complicated question. That's actually a little bit outside of the scope of factbacks, but it does raise a good point. We, as a community, do actually hold our software vendors liable for making sure that we have secure software. And yet, you now have these organizations that are going out actively looking for ways to bypass them. And those same organizations are also the organizations that are telling us in many ways, or part of the same organization being the government, that are telling us that we all need to be more secure. And I think that's one of the key reasons why this is a, a troubling evolution to me and, uh, and why it actually leads to a few of these contradictions um, as a society on what our priorities are. Well, from my perspective, it, it, it's, it's hard to disagree, but I think that your point adds to both sides of the argument. You know what I mean? Whether it, it, it's mentioned by us or, or by another team. As a lawyer, because I'm looking, you know, for, for, uh, on the problem from this meta legal policy level, so how can we realistically implement some legal safeguards and so on? And to be honest, with, sof with software companies, with software liability, I don't have enough good legal arguments. I don't have enough answers to, s to solve this problem. And honestly, this is a case when, where I can say I don't know how to solve it. OK, now this man on the right. Hi, th um, Mr. Turk from uh, NetBlocks. So my concern is that um, if we criminalize hacking back, then only criminals will have the power to hack back. And I'd like to specifically uh, question Mr. Van Horenbeek about um, this assertion that we have ways to stop attacks, so we shouldn't need to hack back. But isn't that surely asking for a split internet where we start blocking first ASs and then what, entire countries, continents? I mean, where does it end? Surely a targeted approach which doesn't use positions of power uh, like uh, hidden zero day exploits, but maybe uses targeted approaches could be an effective way to avoid you know, building an internet that's splintered, shattered into pieces because we're just shutting off countries because they're attacking. Thank you for that question. It, it's a very good one. Um, it's definitely something that's worth being concerned about. I would say, though, that if you look at the attacks that we've seen so far, even in the case of, let's say, a major distributed denial of service attack, I haven't heard yet of the need to shut down a country or block a country in order to stop the attack. Usually there are more fine-grained means that can be used to temporarily block specific types of traffic while still actually allowing those machines and those users to still access other internet resources. Um, I think what is important to, to think about as we think about building a better system to react to attacks is actually to be there early. So we do need to find ways to inventorize when the, uh, the load of infected machines or the load of affected machines in a particular country or region becomes so large that the attacks become exceedingly large. And this is something that we're seeing, for instance, with distributed denial of, of service attacks today, that they keep, keep on growing in the amount of traffic that they can generate. And so I do think we have a serious gap here uh, that we need to identify better <laughs> metrics to realize early enough when something might grow to that level. And, um, and on top of that, of that uh, the last successful UNGGE, so not the last one, but the one before, um, basically came up with one of the base rules, which was um, in case of serious attacks, uh, uh, the, the state from which the country originates is responsible for taking care of it. So you might block it for some time, and then, because what we were debating here before was like an attack which is sponsored by that state that is uh, actually uh, supporting it. In that case, um, the state might not be, because it's interested that it's not cut off from the internet. Uh, and then you would just go and tell them, hey, guys, uh, there's an attack originating from your place, so maybe you want to take care of that, and then, you know. It's but in the end, um, I support the argument made by Martin before, but that's just on top of that. Um, I'm sorry for making, again, maybe analogy to a real world, uh, <laughs> but we don't think, <laughs> we shouldn't think that digital, you know, in terms of how criminal law and criminalization works, um, is, is really that much difference, different in legal terms. I, I totally support your argument that if uh, that criminalization of hug bags might, you know, raise tension between the states and also make like push it completely to gray illegal criminal area. But I would like to make one example which we probably all know. In most of the states, espionage is criminalized. But 
you can spy, you know, until you're caught. So, I mean, it is a commonly an accepted concept that espionage exists. It's criminalized, it's criminal offense in most of the countries. But most of the times when spies are caught, they are sent back to their country, you know, or exchanged or whatever. Because this is a crime which goes to a political level. So we, I, I don't see a problem in saying that hugbacks are criminal. No problem. But first of all, how we are going to catch them? And then what we, are we going to do in the, in the case of state-supported crimes? And then it goes to the GGE and my first point which I made during, during my first intervention that we do have to think about a proper way to address this on the international level in terms of how far a state can go, what is the right to, right to self-defense, def how the state can respond and so on and so forth. Because small hugbacks might be like petty espionage or petty crime but when the threshold is you know crossed then it's a big issue okay thank you um just before continuing with the on-site participants i would like to know is there any question from the internet not at all <laughs> not at all oh my god oh. okay <laughs> well maybe they'll still come um now uh, the gentleman opposite of me please Thank you. My name is Jörn Erbkuh from the University of Geneva. Um, I'm a bit concerned that it, the an an analogy does not hold completely with espionage because it's a different dimension. Uh, just imagine country A is attacking B or just uh, one at attacker in country A, uh, but makes it look like it's coming from country C. Then country B is attacking C and um, C is taking it as an act of war. And this is a very dangerous situation, and we need to uh, introduce some safeguards, um, s um, bring it to a more international level, have some kind of coordination there, and not having uh, 200 countries attacking back uh, a common infrastructure. That, that's horrible. And uh, even when you look at uh, safeguards for law enforcement, we, we should also look into safeguards against uh, abuse by uh, intelligence agencies. This is very important and we unfortunately in the last years we have seen the opposite. We have seen less and less safeguards, more and more um, uh, funds uh, uh, getting into there and it's not espionage anymore in the c uh, conventional sense, it is broad surveillance and, uh, and broad hacking and that's, that's really troubling me. I think you, you, you got my analogy a bit, a bit wrong. I was talking about criminal law and I said that if espionage doesn't work, this is not going to work at all, exactly because of what you're talking about. Because it's, it's a different dimension, it's, it's, it's much you know, harder to investigate and so on. But the, the analogy is how the criminal law works. Once you criminalize hugback, and, and, the, and the question was about criminalization of hugback, it would be more or less the same, you know, the norm that exists but rarely applies. So I think we are on the same page here. And yes, about uh, implementing safeguards for intelligence agencies, I would be very much for this. Like really, parliamentary oversight, maybe some countries actually have judicial oversight for enabling intelligence agencies to intercept some countries in Europe. And I think it would be good to do the same for hardbacks. Okay, um, also, does anyone from the audience want to react directly to this point? No? Okay. Then we continue um, with the gentleman in the back in the blue suit. Hello, my name is Taras Popolnuk. I'm from the Permanent Mission of Ukraine. Uh, just uh, thank you for this uh, conversation. It is really interesting. But uh, just a few remarks. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the proliferation of this, maybe I could say, about cyber malware and so on. Uh, it's similar to the nuclear weapons um, in such way, but it is more harmful in, because you can't control, you don't need some special equipment or don't need some special, I don't know, some uh, uran or some other materials, and you just need only a computer and that's all. But a good computer, yes, it's, it's uh, expensive, but it's uh, not, uh, not near realistic to buy. But I uh, want to find out about... Um, you mentioned uh, creating some uh, civil controls, but uh, well, how could it possible to create in civil controls in such uh, autocratic countries like North Korea or Russia or some others, I don't know. But it is uh, impossible because um, the government of that country, they try to suspend every activity 
and it is not possible to, um, to control these countries. And uh, as it was mentioned by the other speakers, uh, that usually country is not taking responsibility for their attacks. So it, uh, it could be make, uh, it could be do some false hack, uh, false hack back attack. As mentioned the previous uh, the speaker that, for example, A, B, C, it could be hacked some other country, C, and it, the people of that uh, nation could be harmed because it, uh, the attack could be directed to the medical uh, infrastructure, to the, some civil other, for the critical energy and so on. Uh, so I just want to find out if there is such other controls of uh, the possibilities of control. They, as you mentioned, the Tatiana, there is no legal, uh, no legal bindings, no international uh, accords. Uh, it is now only discussing the possibility of creating such dig digital Geneva Convention, but it's not realistic for some. And uh, what will be the responsibility of, for example, of such false kickback? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question. You will, anyone? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry if it looks like I'm hijacking this discussion. Um, about um, adversaries who do not have any safeguards and do whatever they want. Well, I believe that if a country, I don't know, will capture my citizen and hang him or her, I shouldn't, you know, use a Talio principle and hang their citizen. Why I'm saying this? I think that if, I, if I'm in my country, uh, if my country is a target for surveillance, let's say from North Korea as my adversary, I still can hug them back, but be transparent on my side. I still can be an accountable government, you know, I still can implement this for my own sake. It's, it will still mean that I will hug, you know what I mean? But on my side, at least, I, I can ensure that I will hug responsibly. But I totally agree with you um, that many analogies will break in terms of control, because you don't have to get access to restricted materials to create a warfare. You're, apparently you need resources, you need tons of resources, but they're hard to, hard to trace. So they can be created on the governmental side or on the company side, if company has enough, uh, enough power. I mean, I, I, I technically I'm, I'm still spinning my head around this. But you cannot trace this because you don't have restricted materials. You don't have something that you can register and trace. So in this sense, it's, 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 to, to me, it looks like impossible. But I don't think that, you know, the, the possibility for someone to use these tools against me mean that it doesn't, it means that I can actually hug back because I want to have this capacity, I want. But it doesn't mean that I should do it irresponsibly considering my system, my <coughs> politics, my citizens, my safeguards. Um, yeah, addressing the question of the gentleman in the back. Um, I'd say raising the North Korea, China card is kind of tricky in these debates, obviously, um, as we'll be raising the Saudi Arabia card when talking about human rights. Um, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be concerned about, <laughs> uh, I'd be concerned about escalation, so I'm not sure uh, uh, the approach that Tatiana mentioned would be um, completely um, uh, feasible in a lot of contexts because of how, again, how uh, Martin and I mentioned that escalation can be um, as quickly as uh, the declaration of war between states. So to put an example, uh, the US, I believe it was yesterday that apparently attributed the WannaCry uh, proliferation of uh, ransomware to North Korea, right? And we need to step back a bit and learn how WannaCry actually uh, started because of an exploit in a, in a protocol on Microsoft software uh, that was released by the shadow brokers. Uh, some hackers that got into NSA infrastructure and got a lot of their um, uh, vulnerability hoarding that I was mentioning. Um, so again, uh, I'm worried about escalation. So how long until this gets nuclear? Uh, um, it, it's not a far-fetched having Trump in office. So again, just, just raising that concern. I really like uh, Tatiana's uh, focus on transparency and responsibility. And I think at a domestic level that actually addresses a lot of issues. 
Um, I think for me the challenge really is that at a technical level, you really don't have transparency and responsibility in the sense that you, you have no way of really measuring that and, and keeping track of whether it has actually happened. When a piece of malware is found in another country, uh, people don't know why it's there. They won't know where it came from. Attribution, which has been a big thing here at the IGF, is very much imperfect. And even when you look at countries that are attributing, they're making a political attribution based on technical data. They release some of the technical data, which usually there are ways to refute that technical data. They might be right because they have additional data, which they will never disclose mm -hmm. because they gained it using mechanisms that, that are only theirs. So I feel like transparency and responsibility addresses some of the domestic concerns. I think it does very little to address sort of the risk of you hacking someone who is in another country and then there being misinterpretation. Can you quickly address it? We have more intervention. Yeah, you uh, and then Sven, Sven and then, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. I, you know, I actually agree with this team right now. I always have a problem, you know, when I see any reports about attribution, advanced pers persistent threats and so on, because I see kind of political attribution. I see attribution on this very kind of artificial level to me. And I always have a question. So are these data so sensitive that you cannot disclose even a bit of it, or is it a kind of attribution more political than technical? But on the other hand, if I'm imagining myself technically or legally or politically on the level when I have to make a decision, right, and when I know that I have APT, for example, or I have these guys hacking me, or I really need this hack back to get to know something important about my adversary, and knowing that they are doing the same. That's, that's, you know, when it comes to this level of decision, and I know that they have this tool, will the fact that this is not technically transparent or whatever stop me? I'm not sure, you know, if it's about, if, if it's about my network. And this is where, you know, hard stop for me. This is why I cannot argue against hard bags, because if I put myself for a second in these shoes, I, you know, my answer is yes, I will hug back. Um, when it, just briefly, I think we mentioned it maybe before, but if we, if we look at it from the na national perspective, what happens in a, if a big attack, I mean, North Korea excluded maybe. Uh, so we talk about UNGGE, we have on the OCE level confidence building measures. We have the Vasna agreement, which is now trying to, uh, in the export controls, factor in exploit trading and um, hacking tools without uh, causing a problem for the security researcher community. Um, so on that level, we have we have a lot that's going on right now, um, and at the same time, ha hacking back as a response to a hack is not the only thing you can do. I mean, you have still the entire traditional spectrum of what you want to do, short of war, which is economic sanctions, political sanctions, um, um, uh, other espionage actions, sabotage. So you have a lot of stuff you can do without hacking back, um, and then. The, coming back to the point of uh, where we mentioned that even if we're if we're hacked without the other state having some safeguards, at least we can be the bigger person and have safeguards on our own. Mm -hmm. what, what Tatiana said, and if some of you smiled by, uh, when she said that, I mean we just saw that in the United States they basically published their vulnerability as equities process. I mean it's not codified into law, so maybe by now it's already completely different to what it was a month ago when they published it. But um, factoring that out. Uh, they went public with how they treat their vulnerabilities and how they manage them and what the, what the process is. So and that's one step towards those safeguards which um, they made public and they went ahead with it. So I think um, even though I, I don't qualify myself as a dreamer, um, sometimes that might actually still happen. Okay, thanks. Um, are there any interventions on this topic from the audience? No, right? I, I, Did you I see someone? No. Ah, I okay. Just to say some more things. <laughs> um, okay, but we now. Um, I'm not allowed. There isn't you're, a you're not allowed yet, sorry. Um, my name is Serge Strauss. Um, I'm also on the board of FIRST. What we've heard a lot now is kind of two positions. One is it's going to happen anyway, so we should probably live with it. I think that's kind of giving in. And the other no, one. No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no let no. me just finish. <laughs> And the other, because I don't really want to go down that avenue, and the other one is, is <laughs> we need a lot of transparency and s things like that. But what I rarely ever hear is, is 
assuming there is something like hacking back even in, in states where that don't usually do this, what would be conditions that we, where we would say, mm, maybe, okay, that's okay under those condition, conditions? I mean, in, in legal procedures, the police cannot just go in and trash a house completely just because someone had, has parked his car wrongly. So there, there's this principle that the means should be kind of justify the measures and stuff like that. What would that mean on a nation state level? I'd, I'm just interested in what you say. I'm not really sure there is a solution, but I'm interested in your views. Okay, thanks. I will um, also take your question and then we can answer them together. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, Peter Koch from DINIC. I, I might have lost track, track a bit, so I, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm grateful that, and maybe I'm not the only one, but that's, that, that's not a problem. So I'm grateful that the panel started off with uh, identifying uh, clearly that hackback is a marketing term and then focusing and narrowing down on the, on the different categories. But um, uh, the part we have lost track is that we are talking about police, like civilian mitigation and uh, warfare and everything all at the same time. And we're also talking about safeguards. And safeguards, if, if the escalation is that quick, all safeguards are lost anyway. So bringing this back uh, a bit more to the civilian level uh, and maybe a bit more operational, my question is, we're talking about police uh, and the rule of law and so on and so forth, but police usually works on at least two different legal grounds, which is the uh, uh, version of a, of a danger, imminent or, or active, or prosecution, which usually has more time and more safeguards because the danger is already mitigated. And this averting of a danger we used to call incident mitigation or attack mitigation, and that has worked so far uh, quite well in most cases, and the others then make the headline news. But there's also the aspect of retaliation, which is probably a bit more state-level um, uh, topic, and show of force. And that has happened in, in both uh, spheres, of course, because if you, for example, look at the, uh, say, press coverage around the most recent or last year's avalanche botnet takedown, it is not very clear to me that all the measures activated really were asked for uh, short of the PR effect. Anyway, so the question is, um, uh, how would these different levels of, of uh, rulemaking or law feed into the system and getting a bit more operational even, Back then when we talked about the botnets, there's this interesting idea of vaccinating infected systems. And this is where it becomes practical because people say, yeah, we could just patch these systems because we know who they are. We could fix it, but we aren't allowed to. And apologies for breaking this down to the very operational level, but this is probably something to, to chew on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Um, just a small intervention from my side. We don't have enough uh, we don't have so much time anymore. We have like 10 minutes. So um, speakers who answer now, please uh, make, it around, make your reply a minute long. <laughs> yeah, so um, not too long. And then uh, I, I still have three questions here on my list. So go ahead. Um, maybe uh, someone else uh, first. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you think so? <laughs> no, just, just because you just. I'll try to keep it really short because I know I'm very bad at that. But uh, <laughs> first of all, when it comes to proportionality, I do actually think proportionality is the measure that we use to determine whether a hackback is appropriate or not. What I think is that a lot of the context of the things that can go wrong is actually missed because it's not as transparent as the we hack a system and something may go wrong with that system. There's a lot more that can go wrong. So the measure becomes very different. And I don't think we have the right tools today to measure that. Related to uh, botnet takedowns and, and vaccinating systems, so a challenge there is that even operating system vendors, when they release a patch, the patch may still break systems. So the challenge there becomes we also don't really know what we are going to break. Combine that with the fact that most botnet takedowns are actually feasible without forms of hacking back, although I think some of them may fit into your category one, which is a little bit different than my typical definition. Uh, but I think that's the main challenge with vaccinating machines, and it's something that does need to be really carefully considered. Okay, exactly one minute left. Yeah. I, uh, because I have to repeat myself, not being defeatist, 
just being prepared to the gentleman in the back. Um, the point about um, blue pilling, so uh, um, disinfecting the bots, uh, that's why there's also the walled garden approach where you basically you don't interact with their system, you just cut them off from the internet and tell them here you don't know that and you disinfect yourself. It's maybe not much better, but it's a bit um, less invasive. So that's, uh, that's uh, to that point. Okay. Um, concerning the principles as a lawyer, I mean, there are traditional principles like subsidiarity, for example. You use this measure when, when you cannot use any alternative tools or principles of proportionality, which was, which was already mentioned, and principle of legality. But I think that we can't invent new principles on how we will assess this. We probably have to combine all of them. And even then, I'm still not sure that we, will, we can really make them work effectively in 100% of cases when someone has to react quickly. Um, that's all for me. Was it one minute? Yeah, even Perfect. less. Thanks. Uh, so now we have the gentleman over there. Please. Hello. Uh, two things, kind of one direct response. Um, first, uh, introduction. I'm Phil Eyal from Austria. I'm a copy fighter. I work as a DevOps for an IT security company. And the one thing I want to raise is um, I don't think it's possible to like figure out where IT security ethics are coming from. Uh, like in the discussion, it was kind of given that you know where an attack is coming from, but I think this is something that is easily be, to be spoofed. And the other thing is um, when it comes to consumer products, um, security issues are often fixed in time, uh, though the fixes never come to the customer. Um, this is because because of kind of plant obsolescence. If you buy your iPhone five years later, you don't get any update anymore. Same with Android. And I think this is something that needs to be addressed by governments really fast because with Internet of Things, this issue will become even bigger. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And Lucy, here, please. Thanks. Um, Lucy from Privacy International. Um, I wanted to make a point about safeguards on government hacking, specifically for investigative and surveillance purposes, because there's been quite a lot of work done around that that we could maybe draw on. So um, because hacking for investigative purposes is really intrusive and it's often not based in law and without safeguards and oversight, um, Privacy International has proposed a set of safeguards around this um, to help assess this kind of government hacking specifically against international human rights law as well as security implications of hacking and this was born out of the huge amount of time that UK civil society spent fighting the investigatory powers act um, last year particularly the notion of thematic in equipment interference warrants which was theoretically would allow an agency to hack all mobile phones in London. Uh, so this was a huge issue for us. And um, I have copies of the safeguards if anyone would like them, and I'll not go through all of them, but they really are, yeah. if you would like one, hurrah, <laughs> that really is, you know, is it legal? Will, it, will the security integrity of systems be damaged? Is the act of hacking necessary and proportionate? Um, is there judicial authorization, et cetera? And if you apply human rights law to hacking because of its very nature of being so intrusive and disproportionate, there are very few situations where this kind of hacking would be aligned. But perhaps by using this very narrow range of hacking as a starting point, this is something we can branch out into discussions about other types of hacking and applying further safeguards. Yeah, thanks so much for that hint, and we would all be interested, I think, in that um, in those safeguards. I'll let you reply um, again, one minute each, and then we'll continue with your question. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, just to address uh, Lucy's point and the gentleman from gentleman from first. Um, uh, I'd say we need to step back a bit when talking about these debates and on sef safeguards is taking the nuanced approach in terms of, um, as Lucy mentioned, when talking about um, hacking for surveillance or hacking for uh, investig investigations, uh, judicial investigations, um, and differentiating from intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies' work and activities. Um, when talking about law enforcement, of course it's going to be easier to make them work more transparent. Uh, they're supposed to work up front to citizenry. Um, and talking, talking with a public prosecutor uh, in Argentina, who's the head of cybercrime, uh, a cybercrime division, um, he was pretty confident in that having specific provisions in law uh, to, that, that narrow the use of, of hacking to specific crimes that are not just petty crimes, but are, are like uh, serious crimes, depending, say, on the um, on, on the penalty on the offense, um, and then having um, audits on how 
the activities were carried out. Say you can audit the software, you can audit um, how the malware was um, introduced into a device or uh, what kind of information was gathered through the, those activities. Um, those are the things that they are consider considering in terms of how law enforcement sees uh, government hacking. In terms of intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies, um, as Lucy said, I, I totally agree, we should uh, make a, a presumption on the um, prohibition on hacking on those activities. Um, to the gentleman on the right, um, I totally agree with you. I just want to give you a pointer. Um, the German Consumer Protection Association, supported by the uh, government, actually um, is currently taking a big electronic store in Germany to court for selling Android phones as new, which are um, running outdated Android systems with, with uh, existing vulnerabilities that have not and cannot be patched anymore on that phone. So um, I can keep you updated. It's going to be a very interesting uh, court case. Um, I would like to address the, the, the question of law enforcement, intelligence, and safeguards. I have been talking about this from the very beginning, that we have to separate this. We have to know which domain this tool is used in. And concerning privacy international and safeguard, thank you very much for pointing us to this. Um, I would like to add something. You know, the safeguards would also depend on whether in, in the country the such procedural measures, are, for example, interception, require judicial authorization, because in some countries they do not. And where they do, implementing the safeguards for hugbacks are much easier, because as I said already, some countries have the norms on remote forensic software, like. And, and some, in some of them, the safeguards are quite high, like in France. We can always learn from them in a way. Martin. Thank you. Uh, to the gentleman on the right, uh, I agree that there's a real challenge with uh, devices and their support life cycles and how long the useful life cycle for the consumer actually is. I think in the Netherlands, there's an interesting concept that's coming up, which is called duties of care which tries to spell out what sort of the responsibilities are rather than the legal requirements on a particular organization and tries to tie them together. And I think that might be something interesting to, uh, to catch up on. Related to uh, the comment from Privacy International, I do feel that today, a lot of this debate, we're spending far too much time looking at the securitization of the problem and far too little time actually having multi-stakeholder discussion around what those safeguards should be. And they typically tend to come out of government. And so I highly applaud the fact that something like that was put together. I only wish that stakeholders would actually reach across the aisle earlier and put it together together rather than separate. Yeah, Hans-Peter, please. Okay, uh, Hans-Peter Dittler, also from Germany. Uh, not a question, more a sure. remark. Yeah, uh, very welcome. I like the discussion about setting limits or setting safeguards to this development, but I want to remind you, all hacking or hacking back or hacking forward needs a lot of preparation. <laughs> preparation <laughs> means collection of tools, collection of vulnerabilities, collection of yeah. exploits, preparation of scripts and similar, and everything leaks. There is no possibility to hold this back. No safeguards will ever help because we are humans. Everything can be stolen. Everything could be sold. So there is a market <laughs> for it. And uh, so I'm a little bit s suspecting that safeguards won't limit everything. And so there is something left over. Yeah, thanks very much for that point. Anyone in the audience still have a, an intervention or question? Yes, Tara? Tara Shah, consultant for German government, Ministry of Interior. I, I don't uh, have a remark. I won't, I won't do any remark on this. But I have a, I have a, a question. Um, the question is, why do politicians do decisions on introducing these laws? And uh, I think we should uh, uh, dig deeper to find out why are these laws are coming up. And for me, from my perspective, it is like um, our society has a, uh, a self-image of a country and of, a, of, of a, uh, what this country should do. And the self-image in the, in the pre-internet world was 
the, the country uh, and the, the state is the only one who has uh, to have the force to investigate everything, to uh, look into everything, to prevent any harm to the society. And the internet is simply a game changer, uh, which uh, uh, takes this into, um, into doubt. And, uh, um, but the society w didn't uh, come along with this and uh, tries to ignore this game changing. And we have politicians, they have the pressure of the society, uh, you have to be able to do something with these horrible things. And this, uh, uh, politicians say, oh my God, we need to react. And, uh, and, and then they um, do this uh, sometimes a little bit helpless um, things, like, oh, we have to have a law and to allow them this, ignoring all the impacts because the game, is a, the internet is a game changer and ignoring all this just to mm, satisfy this uh, pressure from parts of the society. Mm -hmm. thank, you for, thank you for that remark. Um, we are closing off the debate now, um, unless any of you has one really short question or intervention still from the audience. The moment is now. <laughs> um, and then I will give each of you, if you want to, still a couple. Do you want to say something still? No. no? Okay. Are you done? So, I'm done. does any one of you still want to say something? Okay. Well, then, <laughs> it's uh, my turn to thank all of you for this debate. I think um, so. It's been the first debate about uh, this um, about government hackbacks uh, in this term um, here at the IGF, and I'm very grateful for your active participation here. You've seen that uh, the debate was also phrased quite intentionally in broader terms, and I'm very happy that we got to discuss a lot of different facets of this. What we will do is um, we'll uh, summarize the report probably and um, uh, put up a synthesis somewhere. We'll still discuss where. If you have any feedback um, to the debate or any other thoughts, please let us know. I'll be here. Um, and all of you maybe uh, for a couple more minutes and otherwise um, you can find uh, our uh, Twitter handles under the hashtags IGF2017 and hashtag hackback. So um, that's the way you can reach us and we're looking forward to any other thoughts. Thank you. Marketing relation, that was a good one. Thank you yeah. very much. Sorry, sorry for being so I, I, very no, it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. Very much. That's that's amazing. Amazing. Thank you. And thank you for bringing this up because this is exactly what, really? what we should be. Yeah. 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 So hey, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you